This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. In 1962, Sonny Liston defeated Floyd Patterson to become the heavyweight boxing champion of the world. Nine years later, he was dead from what police claim was an overdose of drugs. Sonny's family and friends believe he was murdered. In Texas, 21-year-old Elizabeth Campbell stalked off into the night after an argument with her boyfriend. She vanished, and some believe she's being held hostage by a mysterious abductor. Sharon Stevens' childhood was a succession of unhappy foster homes. Then she met a couple who literally changed her life, teaching her the true meaning of the word love. Today, Sharon wants to find this couple and say thank you. Also tonight, the story of how unsolved mysteries helped to bring a family together. Last month, we profiled six Oklahoma children who were tragically separated back in 1960. Thanks to our broadcast, they all met for the first time in more than 29 years. Join me tonight for their touching and heartwarming reunion. September 25th, 1962, the title bout for the heavyweight boxing championship of the world. The current title holder, Floyd Patterson, battles a 30-year-old former convict named Charles Sonny Liston. Liston with a left, a short right to the body, a left hook, and Patterson is down. In two minutes and six seconds, Patterson is knocked out. Sonny Liston is the new world champion. Sonny Liston knocks out Floyd Patterson in one round to become the 21st heavyweight champion of the world. Nine years later, Las Vegas, Nevada, January the 5th, 1971. Liston's wife, Geraldine, arrived back at their home from a trip out of town. She was worried that she had not been able to talk to her husband for several days. As she walked toward their bedroom, she saw Sonny lying on the bed. Sonny Liston was dead from what officials claim was an accidental drug overdose. But his family and friends believe the official verdict may be wrong. I know he never used drugs. He used to drink every now and then, but Sonny never used no drugs. If he did, I didn't know anything about the drugs. I'm sure I know a dope head when I see one. And Sonny never used drugs. I'm sure in Mr. Liston's life, he had enemies. And I somehow believe one of them killed him, or several of them killed him. And I don't think one man could have done it. I'm sure it took several. The rise and fall of Sonny Liston reflects the brutal and occasionally corrupt boxing world that he dominated in the early 1960s. And the circumstances of his death have never been satisfactorily explained. In fact, there's compelling evidence that Sonny Liston was murdered, a victor who became a victim. His story began with a lonely bus ride in 1944. One of 25 children of a sharecropper in Arkansas, Sonny Liston endured frequent beatings as a child. At the age of 12, after selling a bag of pecans for bus fare, Sonny left for St. Louis and a better future. But once he arrived, Liston's life would take a violent turn a path that would eventually lead to prison. Most of his prison records were strong-arming. 
why he would turn in the streets and strong-arm people to get money to make a living. After all, he come from a big family, so somebody had to support him. So he'd done what he had to do to make a living. In 1950, Liston received two concurrent five-year terms for the armed robbery of a gas station. While in prison, Liston channeled his considerable strength into boxing. After 29 months, he was paroled. Get that left hand. Think left hand right. In 1953, Sonny went professional, winning 32 of his first 33 bouts, 22 by knockouts. Sonny was uh, the type of fighter, when he got in the ring, he was mean, he come to fight, and he had only one thing in mind when he went out, and that was to win. By 1962, Sonny was ready to make his successful bid for Floyd Patterson's heavyweight title. He was one of the toughest, the most durable, fighters of all time. You couldn't knock him off his feet. He was awesome. After his victory over Patterson, Sonny was champion for 17 months until he met a young man named Cassius Clay, who would one day become Muhammad Ali. Less than can catch the elusive Clay off of this fight. Cassius Ali's superior agility simply overwhelmed the champion. After six rounds, Liston gave up. Muhammad Ali had won the title. During Ali's reign as champion, Liston stayed in Las Vegas. Rumors circulated that Liston was drinking heavily. During this time, he befriended a boxing referee named Davy Pearl. Sonny was a very hard man to get to know. He was quiet and he was a loner. He was very rarely with anybody because he didn't trust very many people, and I didn't blame him. Sonny was really on the downside with his career, and people beat him out of millions of dollars. You know, phony managers, and they had this going, invest your money with this, and that happens to fighters that strike it rich. And he was such a nice guy, and it was a shame that most people didn't realize how nice a guy he really was. In 1967, Ali was stripped of his title after he refused to be drafted. Liston decided to resume training for his boxing career. Once back in the ring, Sonny won 14 consecutive bouts. Davy Pearl became his unofficial manager and signed Liston to fight an up-and-coming young heavyweight from New Jersey, Chuck Wepner. The two men both had eyes on Ali's vacant heavyweight title. Day after day, Liston prepared to meet and beat Wepner. I wanted Sonny to win that fight, and Sonny wanted to win the fight because had he won the fight, he would have gotten a big money fight. There were rumors that some gamblers were betting heavily on Liston to lose. Johnny Toko believes that two days before the fight, Liston had a meeting two of these gamblers. He glanced over and seen these two black gentlemen, and he said, go over and sit down a while in the lobby. He said, I'll be over in a little bit. Sure you're going to be all right? Don't worry about it. It's be all right. So how you doing, man? I believe that Sonny was approached to drop the fight. He had to be approached because the talk that was around, it seemed to me like they wanted a Chuck, a Chuck Weapon to win. And the only way they can do that Sonny would have to be involved. Welcome to the U.S. Armory. This is the main... June 29, 1970, Jersey City, New Jersey. Sonny Liston was ready to take his first step on the road back to the top. Only local favorite Chuck Wepner blocked his way. Sonny Liston! I said, Sonny, if everything's okay, go to work on the guy. Well... Fifth or sixth round, Sonny told me, and it's the first time in my life that I ever thought I would hear this from him. He says, I'm afraid to hit this guy anymore. He had hit him so many times in the face. By the ninth round, Liston had beaten Wepner so severely that the fight was finally stopped. Wepner needed 54 stitches in his face alone. Sonny Liston had taken that first important step towards regaining his former title, but that step may have endangered his life. January 5th, 1971. 
Just six months after the Weppner fight, Liston's body was discovered by his wife. Police were summoned to the scene. In Liston's kitchen, in plain view, investigators found three small bags of heroin on top of the kitchen counter. A small amount of marijuana was also discovered in Sonny's pocket, and a syringe was found near his body. Take him on down to the morgue. My opinion, there's two things. It was either natural or self-induced drug overdose. And the only reason I dwell on the drug is simply because there was this found in the kitchen. An autopsy discovered needle marks on Liston's right arm, and the official report stated that Liston had died of a cardiac arrest after injecting himself with heroin. But surprisingly, only small traces of heroin byproducts were found in his body. There are some trace of morphine and codeine found in the kidney tissue, but the level of drugs in his own uh, tissues did not indicate that it was an overdose type of drug death. Dr. Davis, you have a telephone call. Just one month before, Liston had been briefly hospitalized after a car accident. He received intravenous medicine in his right arm, and Davy Pearl believes that that is where the telltale needle mark came from. Hey, Sonny. How you doing, my man? Fine. What happened to you? Uh, I bumped the car. You bumped the car? Man, I hate these needles, Dave. He hated needles with a passion. A few times, you know, he'd start to get a running nose or something like that, a little cold. And I said, come on, Sonny, I'll take you to the doctor. He wouldn't go to the doctor. Mr. Liston would not go for common shots, for colds or flu, because he hated the needle to that extent, that he would make a fuss when it was necessary to go. I think Mr. Liston was killed. He was a strong, healthy man. He was not depressed. He was not prone to suicide, certainly. I think uh, Sonny Liston was murdered. Uh, I think that somebody promised him some sort of a deal. At that time, Sonny had no income. And a lot of fellows, you know, proposition for different business deals. He was hanging around with the wrong crowd. And I told Sonny, I said, keep away from these people. But if Liston was on someone's hit list, how was this murder carried out with no signs of violence? Some believe that he was slipped a drug drink and then taken home. Once there, Liston was given the fatal shot. But if this theory is true, why were such minute traces of chemicals found in his body? Even if he had committed suicide, why would he have injected himself with such a small amount of heroin? To this day, Liston's death remains shrouded in mystery. So what actually happened, you know, I often wonder, but I, I, I don't know. He did come from nowhere to get where he was. And I like the world to know that he was a good husband, he was a good man. That's why I like the world to remember him. For the past 20 years, Sonny Liston's accomplishments have been tarnished by the circumstances of his death. Was his death caused by an accidental drug overdose? Or was Sonny Liston murdered because he wouldn't lose when he was told to? Sonny Liston's family and friends demand an answer to these questions. In October, we presented the touching story of a family from Locust Grove, Oklahoma, that was torn apart by poverty and an abusive father. In the spring of 1960, an Oklahoma court determined that Top Rogers and his wife Edith were unfit parents. Their five sons and daughter were taken away and subsequently adopted into six different homes where they grew up isolated from one another. In February of 1984, two of the Rogers' children, Celia Wangler and John Rieger, were reunited after 26 years of separation. How are you? Okay, how are you? Within several weeks, John and Celia managed to find two more of their brothers, Vernon and Robert. Well, when they told me I'd never see my brothers and sisters again, I knew better than that, because I knew I loved them, and they was my family, and I was going to find them. And that never left my mind for... 26 years. For the last five years, Celia, John, and Robert have searched for their two other missing brothers, Joey and Billy. The 
happy ending to this story to me is when I get a phone call from my other brothers. That, that'd be the truly happy ending to have found them. Thanks to our broadcast, John Rieger's dream of a happy ending became a reality. The morning after the story aired, John contacted his brothers Joey and Billy for the first time in almost 30 years. The Rogers children immediately made arrangements for a reunion. Joey was five and Billy just a year old when the family was separated. On the morning of October 27th, 34-year-old Joey, whose adopted name is Rusty Dunnaman, arrived at his sister Celia's home in Oklahoma City. Waiting a long time, buddy. Oh, yeah. a long, a long time. Rusty lives only 36 miles from his brother John. Amazingly, they have mutual friends and have even met socially on a number of occasions. We've brushed shoulders several times. We've been to several places. We were within speaking distance of each other, and I've seen him eye to eye, and I, I never would have known he was my brother. Later that day, the youngest of the Rogers children, Billy, whose name is now Chuck Young, arrived at the airport and was greeted by his brothers and sister. <laughs> Chuck, who lives in Tennessee, watched our broadcast and was shocked when he realized that he was one of the missing brothers. At the end of the show, they put the family picture together. Well, I, I seen me sitting there. And I just got up out of the chair and I said, that's me, that's me, you know, they're looking for me. For the Rogers family, this reunion marks the beginning of a new chapter in their lives. I think what we were all looking for was the part of our hearts that was torn out years ago. And now, you know, I don't, I don't hurt anymore because that part of my heart's been replaced. It, it's back again, and it feels good. <laughs> all right, this is a toast to us, and I want you all to know I love all of you. We, we I love, love you all, too. I'm glad to be here today. It was Christmas morning in Torrance, California. The year was 1957. Sharon Stevens, her parents and brothers and sisters were celebrating around the tree. Sharon's real mother had died in an auto accident when Sharon was three months old, and she had drawn closer to her father. Oh, you shouldn't have. Uh, a buckle. Do you like it? Oh, I like it. I love it. This is great. I'm glad. Give me a hug, man. I love you, Dad. This is great. It's gonna look nice, isn't it? The buckle was silver, and it was Sharon, very pretty. Do your homework. It gives me goosebumps when I think about it. Lying about to me. Getting beat a lot with it. Don't you lie to me, girl. I still think about it now and then, and I get very upset when I think about it. I remember it cutting me quite a few times because the way that the size of the buckle was, it used to uh, cut my skin. Sharon, I told you not to run. I've been slashed in the face and the legs and the arms uh, all over. Once he started, it seemed like he couldn't finish. Like he'd get outrageous. Was it just keep going? I guess until he got exhausted. It wasn't a pretty buckle anymore. The abuse at the hands of her father continued for a year until 1959 when she was taken to live with new foster parents. In a childhood marked by beatings and loneliness, there are a few memories that Sharon cares to recall, save one. A couple named Bill and Cynthia Zielinski took her into their home. And for a few months, Sharon discovered what it was like to live with a loving family. They taught her how to trust, how to communicate, and how to love. Today, Sharon wants to find this couple and show them how an emotionally devastated young girl has grown up into a caring, responsible adult. This is Sharon's story. What is your problem? At her foster home, Sharon was angry and rebellious. She fought regularly with her new parents. You're just trouble. You're nothing but problems and trouble. 
What does it matter to you? If you care so much, why don't you just have your own kids? Just leave me alone. Well, can't you cooperate? Can't you try to go with no, us on some of these leave things? Leave me alone, okay? I can take care of myself. Can't you listen? Can't you obey? No. What do we do? They just couldn't handle me. I had a chip on my shoulder because of everything that happened in the past. And uh, I just felt that, uh, you know, the world wasn't there for me. You know, the world hated me, and so I'm going to be hard. You know, I was very hard and very cold. One afternoon, Sharon came home from school to find her social worker waiting. She had been kicked out of her foster home. It was time to move on again. I was very upset because of the transition I had to make again. I was just a little girl, and I knew no one. I had to make new friends and go to new schools, and I didn't know how the new foster parents were going to be, if they were going to, you know, be abusive in any way that I was already used to. Sharon was sent to the Gardena, California home of Bill and Cynthia Zielinski. At first, she treated her new parents as adversaries. Sharon had grown cynical, tough, and felt that she was only a pawn in a system that didn't care. But as Sharon, time passed, bedtime. she noticed that the Zelinskis were different. I know, but it's 9 o'clock, and it's bedtime. I don't want to go to sleep. I'm not tired. You've had a big day, and I know it's... You can just go to bed. I can take care of myself. No, no, no. At this What's home... What's the problem? Well, someone here just doesn't want to go to bed. And we have rules here. At my other houses, they didn't care what time I went to bed. Oh, the other houses. Tell me about the other houses. They knew how to parent. What were they like? They really knew how to parent. They were childless, and I don't understand how they got all the patients they had, but they hung in there with patients with me. And instead of just giving up and throwing up their hands and saying, forget it, she's a lost cause, they knew that I was probably young enough to change, and they knew that there was a good little girl under all that skin somewhere. You know, I had a good heart somewhere, and they're going to bring the goodness out of me. And they did. Life with the Zielinskis was like something out of a dream. They cared about her, believed in her. Every day when Sharon came home from school for lunch, Cynthia Zielinski was there. She would tutor Sharon with flashcards in an attempt to improve her grades. She forced me to do it, and after a while, I started liking it, and I went from an F to an A student, and then I really liked it. Now, the purpose of the dance bar is for balance, all right? At the urging of the Zielinski, Sharon fulfilled a childhood dream and began to take ballet lessons. What do you think? They built her a dance bar and encouraged her efforts. And they went all out, you know, to make me happy, especially when he put up the bar. You know, my own bar, she even did the ballet steps with me. And it showed me that they really loved and cared for me enough to, you know, introduce me to this type of uh, thing. Sharon, I want you to meet somebody special. They bought me this dancing doll, and there's a lot of love and care behind it. Perfect dance partner. If you don't have anybody to dance with or somebody you need to talk to, here she is. Why don't you try her out? She's beautiful, I love her. Happy birthday! Perhaps the high point of her childhood was a birthday party at a neighbor of the Zielinski's. In honor of the occasion, Cynthia had bought her a party dress. And at first I was a little skeptical of going, and Mrs. Zielinski went with me, you know, and I thought, okay. And so she, uh, she gave me the present, you know, she wrapped it all up, and uh, I took it to the birthday party, and... I think my present was one of the best ones there. And it made me feel proud that she went out of her way to, uh, you know, make everything, you know, work out and to make me happy. I felt very special for one of the first times in my whole life. You're welcome. I'm glad you like it. So I started to change in the right, respectful way. They taught me respect. They taught me how to, uh, you know, respect other people and myself. And that uh, they brought my self-esteem up and because uh, I had a very low self-esteem about myself. They really changed me. I never wanted to leave, but I had to one day. Come on, she has to go. She got to work out. Just one year after she arrived, Sharon's dream came to an end. Her father had remarried, and the court ordered that Sharon be returned to his custody. Come on, don't give me a hard time. I remember hugging Mrs. Zielinski goodbye, and I had no choice. 
and it was very, very scary. I felt so safe at the Zelensky's and loved at the Zelensky's, and that's what I wanted and that's what I needed. And uh, that was no more. So I went back with my dad and uh, my new stepmother and six of her kids, and none of us got along. I just didn't feel safe anymore. I didn't feel loved anymore. I was very homesick all the time for him. A lot of times I would pick up the dancing doll and remember the good times that I was dancing at the Zelensky's with it. And uh, I cried dancing with the doll, but it made me feel a little safe. And I did have at least one memory of them, you know, present with me. Not long after Sharon's return, she came home from a friend's to find her brother waiting. What are you doing outside? Dad's inside, and he's got his belt off, and he wants you to get inside. What did I do? You're late. But I'm not late. I told him I'd be home at this time. All I know is that he wants you to get inside. This is Zelensky. This is Sharon Stevens. The Zelenskys immediately sent a cab to pick her up. Sharon, are you okay? Sharon was comforted by the Zelenskys, and in their company, she finally felt she was safe. Are you okay? I said, I didn't feel love there, and I want to come home. And she said, okay, you're home now. And so we talked a couple of hours, and I asked her not to tell my dad, and she said she wouldn't, and I went to bed. And I went back in the same bedroom I slept in, and it felt good. It did. It felt so good. It felt so safe again, you know, and I thought, good, I'm back home. I'm not ever leaving again. Look, there's nothing to be concerned about. My daughter. A few hours later, Sharon awoke to hear her father's voice. Give me a call. My first thought was I was very upset with the Zelenskys for calling. I thought, you know, I felt betrayed. And uh, I thought, why would they do this to me? And I slept by a window. And my second thought was to go out that window and run again. The Zelenskys assured Sharon that her father had promised not to hurt her. Reluctantly, she left her sanctuary. But when she arrived home, she knew her worst fear was about to come true. My dad first just said, go to bed, get your pajamas on and go to bed. And I thought, no, it's not going to end here. I know my dad too well. So I went in my dresser drawer. I put on four or five pair of pedal pushers, which they were called back then, and a bunch of blouses. And then I put my pajamas over it, patting myself, knowing something was going to happen. And so I got into bed and put the covers way up on me. And sure enough, about 10 minutes later, my dad came in with his belt off. And he just started swinging. And I mean, I was flying all over that bed. When he left the room, he said, uh, stay in bed. And I was just shaking because it hurt so bad. Through all those clothes, he had cut me, all of them. And um, he walked back in, and I was sitting on the side of the bed, and he screamed at me and said, I told you not to get up. And he had still had the belt in his hand, and he slashed me right across the face. And uh, I mean, just zip me, just blood. And with that belt buckle. And I thought, my God, what did I do wrong? You know, I didn't do anything wrong. And uh, then he left the room. And a couple of days later, school started, and he was arrested for child abuse. After school authorities contacted the police, Sharon was placed in three more foster homes, but not the Zelinskys. Sharon still has no idea why. When she was 16, she gave birth to her first child. When she was 18, her second baby was killed by an abusive relative. But in 1974, Sharon's life began to change for the better when she met her husband, Dean. Today, she is living near her married daughter and has a six-year-old son. It's not easy to be a parent, but it's easy when you have the right tools. I know I would have turned out different. And a lot of it is because of Zelensky's. I know if it hadn't been for them, I probably would have been a child abuser, a drug addict, a prostitute, a very active alcoholic. I feel I would have 
turned out very bad if it hadn't been for them. You had the freedom in your other homes and... Sharon's search for the Zelinskys will continue until she finds the couple that literally saved her life. They don't think much of us yet, but we think a lot of you already. I would like to be reunited with the Zelinskys to tell them how much I appreciate what they've done for me in the past. And it's a dream, a hope, a fantasy, whatever you want to call it, but I've got to find these people and I've got to say thank you. For 13 years, Sharon tried to find the Zelinskys, but was unable to locate them. And just minutes after her story aired, Sharon's search came to an end. Bill and Cynthia Zelinsky were watching our broadcast and called our telecenter. We immediately put Sharon in contact with Bill and Cynthia, and they made arrangements for a reunion. On November 25th, Sharon arrived at the Zelinsky home in Laguna Niguel, California, and met Bill and Cynthia for the first time in almost 30 years. Hi, Sharon. Hi. Oh, Sharon. Oh, Bill and Cynthia who are now retired, were shocked when they saw Sharon's story. Oh, nice to see you. When you see your, your own life, a part of your life history unfolding on national television, your mind goes blank. You don't hear anything else that's going on, but your mind goes back to 30 years ago and all the, the memories that it brings back. <laughs> I was very optimistic that someone out there, their friends, relatives, neighbors, someone, if not their self, would see it. And I was very surprised that they themselves called in. And uh, just got goosebumps when I found out. And I still get goosebumps. OK, everybody smile and give me a pretty pose. For Sharon, the reunion with the Zelinskys was a long-awaited chance to say thank you for the inspiration and courage they gave her as a young girl. Making a difference in somebody's life is nice. That's the only way to describe it. You feel like there was a reason for what happened. At the time, you don't know it, but now you realize there was a reason for what happened. Ten more minutes, right? It's the only dream that I've ever had, is to find the Zelensky. And it feels great. And it's like a dream come true. Next, the story of a girl missing for almost two years. Eyewitnesses have seen her accompanied by a strange man who experts believe may have forced her into prostitution. <laughs> 10 p.m., April 25, 1988. 21-year-old college student Elizabeth Campbell got into an argument with her boyfriend Ricky and angrily walked out of his home Colleen, Texas, near Austin. Forty-five minutes later, Elizabeth called Ricky from a payphone 11 miles away. Hello, Ricky speaking. Hi, it's me, Elizabeth. Where are you? I'm at a store in Copper's Cove. How'd you get there? I got a ride. I'm a little scared. Just come pick me up. Why did you Elizabeth leave? called me from the convenience store. Yeah and he wanted me to come pick her up. We got in kind of a little disagreement there because I was asking her why she left my house without telling me. That kind of frustrated me a little bit. I didn't understand really why she would do something like this because it's not like her. Look, never mind. I'll call my parents. Don't worry about it. That night, Elizabeth Campbell disappeared. Her friends and family have not seen or heard from her since. The daughter of a marine engineer and his Korean wife, Elizabeth, lived at home, but was looking forward to attending Texas A&M in the fall. This was to be an important step for Elizabeth, for she had led a quiet, sheltered life and had always stayed very close to her family. As soon as we knew she was missing, we knew something had happened to her because it's too much out of character for her to not tell her mother where she was when she wasn't at home. I need you to fill out a call card for me, please. If you could put your name, your phone number, and your address here for me. In a case such as Elizabeth Campbell's, where we have a, a responsible young lady 
that for no apparent reason has just disappeared. One of the theories is, and it's very possible, that Elizabeth is dead. Uh, excuse me, have either of you seen this girl around? Elizabeth's parents refused to believe that their daughter was dead. They launched their own investigation, distributing thousands of flyers throughout Central Texas. Their determined efforts soon paid off. Only six days after she was reported missing, a girl matching Elizabeth's description was spotted by a convenience store clerk near Waco, Texas, about 85 miles from where she disappeared. At this uh, car drove up to the fuel tank, and a man got out of the car and took a young woman by the arm and brought her into the store with him, holding on to her arm. It wasn't as if it was a boyfriend-girlfriend type hold. Uh, the, his hand was above her wrist. How are you there? I was up to the counter and pushed a $20 bill out with one hand off of a roll of money. And I said, is there anything else I could get you? And he just shook his head. The girl looked up at me, you, and I said, yes, could I help you? That's all. He said something to her in a language that I didn't understand, and she dropped her head, looked down, as if uh, she was being punished or something, you know, for trying to say something. She just hit, put her face down. And that was the end of that. Her mother came into the store a couple of weeks later, asking could she uh, put up this poster in the window about a missing girl. And it hit me just like that. I've seen that girl. And uh, she showed me another picture, a, a photograph. And I said, that's the girl I saw with another man in the store a couple of weeks ago. Hi. You've seen that girl. In Compress Cove, Texas, you two miles from where her daughter disappeared, Hi. Elizabeth's Hi. mother discovered someone else who claimed to have seen Elizabeth just two weeks after she vanished. When Mrs. Campbell came in, she came up to the counter with three pictures and asked me if I had seen her daughter. And I had told her, yes, that I had about two weeks prior to that. And she was with an Oriental man and that they came in and got ice cream, and the whole time he brought her in, he was holding her by the wrist. 50 cents, there you go. Thank you. Have because the second sighting matched the first in nearly every cream. detail, the Campbells were positive that in both cases, a young woman was Elizabeth. What would you like? I'd like to have the some first starters. thing that caught my eye was his, he had a real mean, rough look to him. He gave the attitude that he didn't want her to talk, just to stay silent. And that's a weird situation, because if someone wants to talk, they usually talk. But she didn't. When I handed the strawberry cone to him, Elizabeth Campbell looked up at me. You look very sad today. When I said, you look very sad today, she immediately dropped her eyes back down and wouldn't look back up at me. And vanilla for you? Elizabeth Campbell looked like she was being pulled around. She wasn't with him by choice. Despite these two sightings, local police are not convinced that the young woman seen with the Asian man was Elizabeth. But two months later, on July 10th, another person claimed they saw Elizabeth, this time at a gas station in Garland, Texas, 150 miles from where she had vanished. I just left my car going in to pay for the gas, uh, and I bumped into Elizabeth coming out of the store. Oh, sorry. You okay? I'm sorry. Excuse me. Excuse Elizabeth me. acted as if maybe she was frightened of someone, or maybe she was, was being watched, or that she was speaking to someone that she shouldn't be. And I felt like she was really wanting to say more than you know, excuse me. When I saw the photograph of Elizabeth, I automatically knew that that was the girl that I had bumped into in Garland because she had a, a tooth that overlapped on the right-hand side when she smiled at me. I was just positive that that was Elizabeth Campbell. 
Based on these three sightings, Elizabeth's parents believe that their daughter is alive and is being held against her will. We believe that uh, she's being controlled by someone that uh, she's no longer able to think for herself or try to come home or call. Have either of you seen this girl around? The Campbells fear that Elizabeth may have been abducted and is being forced to walk the streets as a prostitute. Usually when someone abducts another person uh, for purposes of prostitution, they, they have a whole process of where they strip away their identity and supply them with a new one. Oftentimes it involves being repetitively raped. They may be beaten with whips, they may be tied up, they may be chained. Um, they're deprived of food, they're deprived of light, they're deprived of water, of whatever it takes in order to strip away their identity and to, to force them to assume another one. Hi. Hi. Dr. Hi. Lewis Lee is a sociologist and founder of Children of the Night, an organization that rescues young people from prostitution by providing counseling and helping them find shelter. Over the past 10 years, she has worked with thousands of young boys and girls who have been forced into prostitution. My guess in, in a situation as Elizabeth is that she's locked up against her will and that the people are brought in to sexually abuse her or to take nude pictures of her, or to even film her in acts of pornography. Um, it does not, from the things I've learned about this case, it does not seem to me that he would actually put her on the streets and let her work alone. But if the woman sighted in Garland was Elizabeth, she was alone. Why didn't she try to escape, or even ask for help? The pimp creates an invisible leash by presenting himself as if he's omnipotent, as if everybody works for him. So no matter where you go, no matter what you're doing, I've got someone who works for me or a friend of mine watching you. So I don't think that she's going to really try and escape because she knows what the consequences are if she does try to escape and doesn't get away. That's why she would never make eye contact with anyone. She's not allowed to make eye contact with anyone. And if she does, and she looks like she's asking for help, then she goes back to the closet until she's learned. Excuse me. Have either of you seen this girl around? Why? She's our daughter and she's missing. Like Although a year and a half has passed since Elizabeth's disappearance, her parents refuse to give up hope. No way we can give up until we find out where she is, what's happened to her. She's our daughter, not what somebody's tried to make her. She'll always be our little girl. Experts believe that with the love and support of her friends and family, Elizabeth will be able to regain her pride and her lost sense of identity. There is currently a reward for any information that leads to Elizabeth returning home. Today, Elizabeth Campbell will be 22 years old. She's five feet, two inches tall, weighs about 97 pounds, and has long brown hair. Her eyes are brown, and she occasionally wears glasses. Based on the two eyewitness descriptions of the man seen with the young woman, he appears to be about five feet, seven inches in height, age 25 to 30, weight 160 pounds. He has acne scars on his face and seems to have plucked his eyebrows. In both sightings, he was wearing a silver martial arts medallion on a gold chain. Next week on Unsolved Mysteries. Ralph Sigler was a career army officer with a wife, a loving daughter, and a secret life. For over 10 years, Sigler was a double agent feeding the Soviet KGB false information. But in 1976, Sigler was found dead in the Maryland hotel room. The U.S. government called his death a suicide, but Ralph's family believes it was murder, and they want to know who was responsible. Join me for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries.
Thank you.